Dublin City in 1913 The boss was rich and the poor were slaves The women working and the children hungry Then on came Larkin like a mighty wave The workmen cringed when the boss man thundered Seventy hours was his weekly chore so we all have heard the song of Substation it starts off in Dublin City in 1913. The boss was rich and the poor were slaves. The women working and the children hungry. Then all came larking like a mighty wave. Prior to 1913, not a lot of people in Dublin were organised in trade unions. It was mainly just skilled workers like carpenters, stonemasons and the like. Poverty was rife. Up to a quarter of the working population were living in tenements, essentially one family in one room. A lot of work was what you now call precarious, casual work, people queuing up down the docks or in various warehouses each morning, hoping to get picked for a day's work. And the wages were low, they were very low. They were lower than anywhere in England, they were lower than Belfast. The child mortality rate in Dublin at the time was as bad as the child mortality rate in Calcutta. This gives you some idea. It wasn't a great place if you were just an ordinary person. On the 4th of January 1909, in a tenement house over on Townsend Street, just off Pierce Street, the Irish Transport Workers' Union was formed. It started off small. Its assets were listed as, and I quote, a couple of chairs, a table, two empty stout bottles and a candle. That's what they started with. Over the next four years, they grew to 10,000 members, which was over 10% of the adult working population in Dublin at the time. There were about 90,000 adults working in the city at the time. The founding members of the union were very much influenced by syndicalism, particularly the syndicalism of the industrial workers of the world in America, which later both Connolly and Larkin were organisers for. The idea behind syndicalism is that all workers should unite in one great union and use the sympathetic strike to get better conditions, better pay, a better future. By sympathetic strike, what was meant was that all workers would refuse to handle anything, have any contact with, do any business, provide any services to any business where the workers were in dispute with their employer. It was obviously very, very effective. It was so effective that not only did it get up the noses of the employers, but the employers organised, I suppose what today you would call a conspiracy to smash this new union. It was most famously seen in the notorious letter issued by William Martin Murphy and 400 other employers in the city to all their staff, which said, I hereby undertake to carry out all instructions given to me by or on behalf of my employers, and further I agree to immediately resign my membership of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, if a member, and I further undertake I will not join or in any way support this union. <coughs> in late August of 1913, the workers in the parcels office of the Dublin United Tramway Company, which was owned by William Barton Murphy, just over there, we're told, you sign that letter now or you're out the door. Each worker in there refused to take off their union badge and certainly refused to sign that letter. In return, they were each handed a piece of paper which said, as the directors of the tramway company understand you are a member of the ITGWU, whose methods are disorganising the trade and business of the city, they do no longer require your services. <clears throat> what was the response to this? On the 26th of August, shortly after 10 in the morning, and it was the very first day of the horse show that year out in the RDS, 10 o'clock the dispute began. 
tram drivers stopped their trams wherever they were, in the middle of the street, on the bridge, out in Holt, wherever, stopped their trams at 10 o'clock on the dot and walked off the job, abandoning their trams in the street. Eventually, over the following month or six weeks, close to 20% of the entire working population of Dublin had been locked out by their employers because they refused to sign that letter saying that they would not join or support the Transport Union. Two days later, Jim Larkin and other union leaders were arrested and charged with seditious speaking and seditious intent to break the public peace and to spread hatred towards the government. There was quite a response to that, and they were released later that day. <clears throat> the following day, the 29th of August, Larkin and others were down at a meeting outside Liberty Hall, which stood where the new Liberty Hall is, down in Beresford Place. They received word and copies of a proclamation issued by the authorities prohibiting a public meeting which was planned for here on the 31st of the month. Before 10,000 people down in Beresford Place, Larkin burnt a copy of the government proclamation and said, banning or no banning, he would be here to address that meeting. On the 30th of August, that was the following day, the police issued a warrant for Larkin's arrest accusing him of inciting people to riot and to pillage shops. When the meeting gathered here, well actually before we get to that, the night before the meeting was to take place, there were police attacks on a number of working class districts. There were police riots and back charges in Riggs End, down in Beresford Place, and just over the bridge on Eaton Quay. Two workers, James Nolan and John Byrne, died from injuries they received that night. Both of them had their skulls caved in by members of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. The following day, the band meeting went ahead. Thousands of people gathered here and hundreds and hundreds of police, RIC and Dublin Metropolitan Police were all around. Would Larkin appear? Where's Larkin? An elderly clergyman with a beard appeared over there on the first floor of Cleary's, which at the time was the Imperial Hotel, owned by another business owned by Murphy. This elderly clergyman straightened himself up from his stoop, removed the beard. It was Jim Larkin. He started to address the people. The cops broke in. He was dragged off very quickly. And then they unleashed a merciless baton charge on the people attending the meeting and spectators who had just coming out to see what was happening and people going about their shopping in O'Connell Street. Violent clashes between union members and police then broke out in other parts of the city. We know of incidents in Gardner Street, in Sheriff Street, on the North Wall, over in Henry Street further down in Mary Street, on the south wall down the docks, up at Christchurch and in each core. And that was just on that one evening. We're now just going to go across the road to the side door of Eason's, and I'll tell you a little bit about Eason's role in the dispute. <laughs>